Hey, thank you, ladies. Thank you for the note, Debbie. And... Oh, for, oh, and thank you for these cards. We, I think we've had different people give um, Bibles in our memory through the years. I bet there have been 30 or 40 or 50 Bibles given in our day, quite a bit. So I appreciate that. <clears throat> so tell you what, this is, a, I think, a really wonderful lesson that we're on, wonderful things that we're reminded of, of course. <laughs> I think we're going to approach this a little bit differently. I'm going to uh, go through some of these verses rather uh, quickly. I'll just name the things that uh, we learn. And I'm trying to get toward the end of the lesson today. Usually, um, long about mid-lesson, God's power for God's work and will. I want us to discuss some certain things from that point forward. So I'm going to just say... Uh, go over some things here uh, that I've thought about and hopefully I'll bless your hearts. But the first thing, we're talking about the gift of his power. Uh, first of all, what does power mean? When you think of power, what would you say is a definition? I mean, it's not like mathematics, you know, 10 to the 15th power, okay, or... <laughs> plug in uh, the electric cord to the power source, um, although you might think of power in that way, but... Authority. Okay, power, authority, yes. Strength. Strength, okay. I think even nerve. Nerve, courage, bravery. Uh, yeah, the nerve to act, okay, when it's needed. And even if it doesn't look like the outcome may, may be good. What example have we seen that, have we seen in just the recent month um, in Ukraine? Yeah. Um, I, it was unbelievable when our president says to the president, you know, Russia's attacking. And he, the, you know, President Biden says, hey, we'd like to evacuate you and your family. He says, I don't need a ride out of here, the president. I need ammunition. And then it's not long after that that you go ahead and you see that they're handing out guns to just everybody, okay? And then they had a ban. The 16 to 60-year-olds couldn't leave the country. Men, we require, we want you to stay here and fight for the country. And so that really is what power is. It's the capacity for action, um, whether that's physical mental, moral, uh, in any of those realms. Uh, sometimes our physical being, we don't have much power. Maybe, you know, you get some kind of problem with your body and so your body doesn't work like it's always worked before. Uh, but maybe your mental, mental <clears throat> capacities can be uh, diminished at times too. But our morality, the things we choose to do, we can have power to choose the right things. But the verse that is given to us, first thing, Matthew 28, 18. And so what's Matthew 28 bring to mind? Anyone with your Bible reading just off the cuff? Matthew 28 is the Great Commission at the end of the chapter. But here, just before the Great Commission, Jesus came and spoke unto them saying, all power, you know, how much power is that? <laughs> okay, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And so I want to take just a second here to ask you a couple questions when it comes to this. We being the bride of Christ, okay, let's, this is creation, okay, let's just put creation. Here's our timeline. Here's the Old Testament. Okay. Here is uh, the cross. And then here is the return of Christ. Okay. I'll just put a cross there. The return of Christ. And then here 
we have the millennium and I'm again I'm horrible on the board okay but let me ask you this we are a special group of people actually I forgot to add something here this is about another thousand years this is creation or more like 1500 to 2000 uh, this would be what a flood. a flood that's right okay so you've got these different periods of time and then out here we have eternity so but this is what i'm trying to get at did the people who lived here have the indwelling spirit of god no no they didn't in the old testament did the people there have the indwelling spirit mm -hmm. Of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit no, came upon them. That's right. But then here you have a very special group of people who we are called the church or the bride of Christ. So out of all of history, we get to be right here, a very, very <laughs> special group. And so who would we say then the church? In Ephesians chapter 5 talks about a mystery that the picture of a husband and wife is like the uh, marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. And the point I'm trying to get at, if I don't want us to forget, is that if, if he is, we're married to Christ married in the sense that we belong to him he indwells us with his spirit then we're a pretty special group of people and if all power has been given to him in heaven and earth then shouldn't that do something to our prayer life So when we talk with him, when we commune with him, as we read the scripture, as we pray, we're part of his bride. Do you think he's going to pay attention to his bride? <laughs> okay. Yes, he is. There's something very, very special that's taken place here. Um, and I want us to kind of keep that in mind as we go through this. We see his power and his promises that he makes. Yes. In Deuteronomy 29, 29. Okay. Paul is the only person in the New Testament that I know of that refers to this. There might be others, but I don't know them. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Yes. He has hidden, he, there are hidden secrets that God planned for his bride. Yes. In fact, you'll see the Apostle Paul talking about that. Yeah. yeah he, that it was a mystery. The mysteries. Yes. There was a mystery that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. But let's, I don't want to get too far off track. I just want us to recognize and to think about we are part of his bride, a special group of people uh, throughout history. Uh, that have actually been given the promise of the indwelling spirit of, of God himself. Uh, let's look here at Mark 4, 35 to 41, uh, where it talks about um, the power of Christ. Actually, let me just go ahead and tell the story. Jesus is sleeping in the, in the boat and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. The wind and the waves got to be so big and so bad that the fishermen in that boat realized that it was a very dangerous situation. So they go to Christ. He was sleeping, his head on a pillow. And uh, they told him, so what does he do? He gets up and he says, peace be still. And just like that, the wind and the waves Obey him. If you can imagine being in a in a terrible storm and someone stands up and says, 
let's calm down. <laughs> okay. Everything calms down. And he had the power to do that. And the reaction of the disciples was what? Great fear. Yeah, they, they were afraid before. Now they were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like they were afraid because they said to each other, what manner of man is this that he would be able to calm the wind and the waves? That was power they had not seen in any person uh, up until this point when they met him. Um, so let's go on from there. It says uh, at the bottom of page 69, how do each of the following verses describe God's power? And I'm going to give, give just a little synopsis of these verses. Um, in Job 42.2, I know that you can do everything and that no thought can be withholden from me. And we know from scripture and other places too, God knows the very thoughts of our mind. And as his bride, and the indwelling spirit of God, um, he certainly knows what we think, what's in our heart, what we harbor, uh, things that we let spin around our minds that we should get out, or the great things that we think about. Uh, he knows every thought that we have uh, by the Holy Spirit, and that is a lot of power. <laughs> Psalm 115.3, but our God is in the heavens. I like this. And he has done whatever he pleased. <laughs> okay. God can do what God wants to do. Okay. For sure. And then Isaiah 14, 27, for the Lord of hosts has, has purpose and who shall disannul it? Who's going to get in his way when he has a purpose? And his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back? Okay. Who can stop God's hand when he has decided to do something? No one. That's power. And so I'm just going to pick a, a, a word over the next uh, verses. We see in Jeremiah 32, um, the creation, the power of God to create. But if you look at Colossians 1.16, you'll also see, that's not here in your book, Colossians 1.16, it tells us that Jesus Christ was there. There was nothing that was made that wasn't made without him. Remember, he is the eternal son of God. He left heaven and came to earth. Um, I love Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us, a child is born, but at the same time, a son is given. Okay, he left heaven, came to earth, but he was there at creation. Mark 10, 27. Jesus looking upon them saith, with men, it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And that should help infuse our prayer life um, with faith to recognize who we're praying to. Um, and then verse two, or excuse me, question two. Since God the Father is all powerful, we would expect God the Son to be the same. When Jesus walked on earth, what power did he claim to have? Well, Matthew 9, 6, and 7. Um, he had power to what? To forgive, forgive sins. Forgive. And then in Luke 8, 49, 50, what did he have power to do? Raise to raise the dead. Jairus' daughter. He walks in the room. <coughs> you know, he's, he said, oh, she's just sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. Um, he, she wasn't sleeping. She was dead. Uh, but he raised her from the dead, power to raise the dead. Um, and then John 10, 17 and 18, what does that tell us? What did he have power of? Power to lay down his life and to raise it again. Yeah. He, you know, have you ever looked at exactly the timeline of when exactly Jesus died, when he rose again? And uh, it's an interesting thing because the cross, what they did, they laid it on the ground and the person they were going to crucify, they put on the ground. I imagine Jesus went up to that cross and gave himself. Mm -hmm. He put it down. He had the power knowing what was going to happen, not to have someone throw him there and wrestle him to the ground, mm -hmm. 
but probably just lied down. He was born, the Bible says, born to die. And it pleased God to bruise his son this way for us out of love. So Jesus had the power to lay down his life and he had the power to take it up again. Um, and then in John 10, 27 and 28, what did he have the power to do? That's right. He has, has the power to give to us eternal life. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's right. There we have it. Right. So he gives us a promise. He has the power to give us a promise. They will never perish, my sheep. Um, and then John 14, what is it he has the power to do? To answer our prayer. And that's why I like to go right back here because we have this special relationship with him. He, he is ours. We belong to him. We are part of his blood bought bride. When Jesus was sent to earth, um, he, he left heaven. He died. He gave his blood all of this so that we might be able to have the indwelling spirit in our lives. Um, all of these things are very true. And I, I want to say something else. I brought this book today and I wanted to say something more about prayer and how God works. And uh, this whole book, I love Ian Bounds. He's was a writer, I believe, during the Civil War thereabouts. He wrote a lot about prayer, and this is a compilation of all of his books. But this chapter that I found, it says, The Divine Channel of Power. And I like this because it, it tells us, well, I'll just share. It says, The church is looking for better methods. But God is looking for better men. I tell you what, anyone else want to ring their phone right now? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it done. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm teasing you, Melanie. <laughs> okay, so the church is looking for better methods, but God is looking for better men. Uh, John 1, 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And as you see, uh, the church age, God works through godly men and the things that he does through them. I have to say, when I was at Ellen's uh, husband, Bob's funeral, there was a man who stood up who knew him quite well. And I never forget this. He stood up and he goes, there was a man sent from God whose name was Bob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. But it's true. Uh, God uses men. Let me just pick up a couple things from this chapter. The glory and effectiveness of the gospel, it depends on the men and women who proclaim it. The men and women who proclaim it have the power have the ability to either enhance the message or to mar the message. Um, and he's looking for people who don't want to mar it. Um, let me just find another section here. Here's one. The gospel of Christ does not move by popular waves. It has no self-propagating power. It moves as men who have charge of it move. Uh, the preacher, Christians, must live the gospel. It's divine. Um, the constraining power of love must be in the Christian as he projects his, his life. Um, let's go on from here. There's one section I wanted to make sure I got. I will uh, catch this. The man... God's man or woman is made in the closet. What does it mean in the closet? In the prayer closet. 
his life and his most profound convictions are born in his secret communion with God. The burdened and tearful agony of his spirit, his weightiness and sweetest messages are received when alone with God. The burden, excuse me, and prayer makes the man or woman. Prayer makes the person. Um, and then this last section, in the modern pulpit, Prayer is not the mighty force it was in Paul's life or ministry. Every preacher who does not make prayer a mighty factor in his own life and ministry is weak as a factor in God's work and is powerless to advance God's cause in this world. So I think we sometimes want God's power on our lives, but we don't want to spend the time alone with him. And that's what we need to do. But the title of this chapter was The Channel of this power. God's looking for us to be right with him. And then the last uh, section I would like is, um, there was another chapter called The Secret of Power. And I'm thinking, I hope this isn't too secret. <laughs> we do want to find out. Okay, but this is what I found. Uh, and holiness, excuse me, I'll start here. It's a little longer paragraph. No amount of money, genius, or culture can move things for God. Holiness energizing the soul, the whole man aflame or woman, um, aflame with love, with desire for more faith, more prayer, more zeal, more consecration. This is the secret of power with God. And it goes on further, and I like this statement. Um, I guess I have to read the whole thing for you to get it. These we need and must have, and then must be the incarnation of this God-inflamed devotedness. God's advance has been stayed or stopped. It's been crippled. His name dishonored for their lack. Genius, though the loftiest and most gifted. Education, though the most learned and refined position, dignity, place, and honored names cannot move this chariot of our God. It is a fiery one, and only fiery forces can move it. In other words, we have to have this fire in our being that, that wants to be with God, wants to please him, wants to spend time with him. Prayer is the creator as well as the channel of devotion. The spirit of, of devotion is the spirit of prayer. Um, let me skip down. <clears throat> I think I've just got um, just one line. A prayerless age will have only scant models of divine power. Prayerless hearts will never rise to glorious heights. It is the prayer force that makes saints. Holy characters are formed by the power of real praying. And I've shared this with you before. It was my private time alone with God as a new Christian when I just had the word, didn't have a Christian family teaching me anything, didn't have them. In fact, they didn't like me going to church all the time. Um, but it was when I was alone with God in prayer that he dealt with my heart. I had to confess sin. And when I got tired of confessing the same sin over and over, I realized, it's got to go. <laughs> okay, whatever it was. The time alone with God is what shapes us, our character, as we come truthfully before him. The more true saints, the more praying, the more praying, the more true saints. Um, and then there's a section about David Brennard and uh, what he did. He was a man who prayed fervent, fervently. But the channel were his channels of power but the secret of power is we get it from god i wanted to share that with you before we go on let's skip to um question four on page 71 let's just uh quickly go through here the following verses indicate some of the problems we face because we are powerless in the left column, list our problem, then list God's provision. So Psalm 38.4, what is the problem? Anyone? Guilt. 
Well, guilt, yes. Our sins. Our sins. Yes, our sins got over my head. It's a heavy burden. So what's God's provision? Romans 5, 6. He died for the Christ. That's right. Pride died for the ungodly. And then what about 1 Corinthians 15, 22? The problem was what? Our death. Our death? And how did that happen? In Adam, all died. The Bible says by one man, sin entered into the world. And it was Adam. Um, Eve was there. She was part of it. But what made Adam? Why is his name? Why Why is, doesn't it say Adam and Eve? And, all, and Adam and Eve all died. What was Adam's role? He was the leader. He was the head of their home. He should have went... He was standing beside Eve when she had that apple in her hand. Apple, who knows? <laughs> okay, fruit. The fruit. He should have said, Eve, slapped it out of her hand. Put that down. Get it away from me. Get that snake out of this garden. <laughs> okay, but he didn't do that. Uh, what was the provision that was made in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 2 Timothy 1.10? Christ overcame death. That's right. In Adam, all died. In Christ, we have life. He abolished death. I love 1 Corinthians 15. It is the resurrection chapter. And it tells us the last enemy to be destroyed is death. How about Romans 7, 18 and 20? What, what's the problem there? Our sinful nature. Yes. And specifically our, what? Flesh. Our flesh. Okay. And then the solution, Romans 7, 24 and 25. Who shall deliver me? Jesus Christ. That's right. He fulfills all righteousness for us, which is great. More than great. And then Isaiah 40, 29, the problem? Exhaustion. Weary. Exhaustion. We faint. We fall. Um, but then Isaiah 40, 31 tells us what? He gives us power. He gives us the power. We mount up with wings as eagles. Uh, we what? We can run and what? Well, not, we not be weary. weary. We can walk and not faint. But what is the condition of Isaiah 40, 31? Wait. We wait upon the Lord. When we wait upon the Lord, what's it mean to wait upon the Lord? For his timing to answer whatever we need or want. That's right. We can wait upon him, Lord. What do you want me to do? Um, That's the hard part. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know, because again, I've said I'm a fixer, so I can get ahead of the Lord. And that's not a good thing um, at all. Uh, I think. I think we've got uh, plenty of time, but let me just pick up. It says, as stated at the page top of 72, as stated in the verses below, for what other particular things do we need the Lord's power? So what do you have for the answer to uh, John 1, 12 and Romans 1, 16? Anyone? For salvation. For salvation, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Um, and then, of course, uh, Romans 1.16. Remember I've told you about my Walter Oldroyd, my Sunday school teacher. These were two of the verses he used to fire at me. <laughs> okay. When I'd say hello at church, he wouldn't say good morning. You know, he'd fire a verse at me, a reference. I had to give it back. These were on my list. <laughs> okay. Romans 1.16, for what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Um, it is the what? Power of God unto salvation. So this uh, power, it takes God's power to give us salvation. The rest of that says, uh, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Yes. So we're always going to be second? Um, the power of God unto salvation. Well, Remember, Jesus came unto the Jews, and the Jews what? They rejected, rejected him. him. We're grafted in. Mm -hmm. But remember Galatians uh, 2, 2, 2 uh, 20, I think, or somewhere in that, there where it says, at the foot of the cross, 
There's neither male nor female. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Okay, so at the foot of the cross, we're all equal. Okay, his blood cleanses us from sin, just like any Jew who puts their faith in him. So no, we're not coming in second. I'm just thankful I'm coming in at all. <laughs> yes, that's true. Okay. All right. Yes. So that, that verse in Galatians helps us with that. Um, 1 Peter 1, 5, Jude 24, we're kept by the power of God through faith. But let's stop for a second and look at Acts 4, 31 to 33. Does someone want to get that? Acts 4.31, we'll just read that section that we done up there. Go ahead. Um, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were given testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. That's great. This is a great section of scripture. So what happened? What was the cause? What made the place shake? When they prayed, right? Um, 31, when they prayed, the place shook. And what was happening there? They were speaking with boldness. Uh, what about you as you became a Christian and served the Lord now? Are there times when all of a sudden you have an opportunity and you speak? And uh, maybe it's someone you'd been praying about an opportunity to share the gospel with, uh, to talk with them about. And all of a sudden you have the right words and God's helping you. And all of a sudden you get done with the conversation of like, I didn't realize I could say that or do that. God helped me. Okay, when we pray, we rely on him. He helps us. Uh, that's what got me in trouble with my family. Um, seriously, when I was uh, uh, finding my way as a Christian, um, I just always talked about the Lord. There was just this overflow of that time I spent with him. And I always had always talked about the Lord. And so if I had someone come to visit, um, I would be standing in the kitchen and my family would hear me talking about God. Uh, it just was the way I was. I took my Bible. It was a work God was doing in my heart and life. It was his work. But when I say it got me in trouble was because my family didn't like me talking about the Lord all the time. And so that I think I've shared with you, I was in the living room one afternoon and um, all of a sudden I, the whole family was there. Nobody was missing. And, um, and all of a sudden I heard someone say, who do you think you are talking about God all the time as if you know him? And it's like, I do, <laughs> but I didn't say that. I was so hurt. I just ran out of the room. I was about 15 years old, 16. I ran out of the room and just cried. And, um, but I have to say everyone in that room that I know of came to know Christ with the exception of maybe one, but that person we're still in contact with and still hoping that he puts his faith firmly in Christ. Um, but tell you what, let's go on from there. Oh, I wanted to say too, notice, with great power, they witnessed to the resurrection. Remember, this was predicated by prayer. They could speak powerfully about the resurrection because they had prayed and spent time with God. Um, and I love the statement, great grace was upon them, meaning God was giving to them what they didn't deserve, but he gave them this wonderful blessing that they could pour out their hearts to these people, um, talk about the word of God with boldness, witness to the resurrection, and experience having the great grace of God. And that's amazing. Um, 
And I think what we'll do, Ephesians 1, 18 to 20, it says, how is this power which works in us described? I just have in big letters, truth, that we might know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. But tell you what, let's go to John 15. And if you want to open your Bibles there, and then we'll, we'll have more time to discuss. I wanted to get through that stuff quickly so we could... Um, have more time to talk about these things. In John chapter 15, and again, I've said, whenever you see John, anything past 13, like 14, 15, 16, 17, what are we looking at? Pardon me? Someone said it. What? Last the last words. That's right, because 13 is the Last Supper. Judas goes out to betray him. He takes the group out with a song, and they end up in, at the Mount, uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, and there he prays there, Garden of Gethsemane, Mount of Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, my mind's off. Let's go looking at that and make sure I get it right. Yeah, um, yeah when the I am the vine, I think mm -hmm. it's the Olivet Discourse yeah. they call it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said Garden of Gethsemane. That's Tell me, the Garden of Gethsemane is late that night, right? right? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. when they come, he ends up in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? But tell you what, let's go ahead and read 15, 4 through 8. Does somebody want to get that? Read that. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Two, eight. Yes, six. That's right. Do nothing. Uh, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. Herein is my Father's Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Very good. Well, tell you what, um, don't forget you're part of the bride as I erase it here. Um, here's something, and, and you've seen this before because we've gone over it before, but it's in our lesson today and it's a great, great lesson. Okay, here is what? The vine. Here is the vine. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> and so what's the vine represent? The Father. Christ. Okay, remember, these are his words. And he's saying here, 15.1, I am the true vine. And then, so we've got Christ. He's the vine in this picture. And um, and then we have what? Branch. Branches. Branch. Okay. And so what do the, what's the branch represent? Us. Us. Okay. So that's, we'll just put us. Okay. And the branches can go all over the place. Okay. <clears throat> And then we have the branches are supposed to do what? Bear fruit. Okay, they're supposed to bear fruit. There we go. Some can bear, they have the capability to do what? To bear much fruit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, yeah, we don't have to do much more. Okay, so we'll just do that. So we've got this idea that. So here's the vine, Christ, and we have to be attached to
to the vine. The branch is what happens to a branch if it's detached from the vine, of course. It dies. It dies. It, dies. it withers. It, it dies. It's gone. Um, and so I want to ask this question. We often, as Christians, that looks weird to me. Um, as Christians, we focus a lot on um, on this part, right? Mm -hmm. Some people might even feel bad because they'll see some Christian who's maybe they're winning people to the Lord. Maybe they're just joyful all the time. And you see all this fruit in their lives. Their whole family is serving God together. I know one family that the Lord got hold of their hearts. This is in our former ministry. And you just had to ask them to do something. And as a family, they would show up and it was like they were chainsaws. They just worked through whatever it was whatever was at this level it was this level when they were done um, with what they did tom and may hudson and their three boys um, but tell you what so some people can produce a lot of fruit maybe not so much uh, fruit but there's some and you can start to compare and start to look well i don't i don't seem to have as much fruit as that person or What's the Bible tell us about that? He that compares himself, they that compare themselves among themselves are what? Are not, not wise. Are not wise. So God has a special purpose for each of us. And so what we, what we do is up to him. The fruit that's produced in our life is up to him. But the part I want to really emphasize today is we aren't to focus so much here where we are to focus is right here. This is our focus, okay? Because we are to abide in the vine. When we abide in the vine, what's this chapter promise us? If you're focused on abiding in the vine, then the fruit is going to be there. God is going to produce the fruit in our life. Um, and that's a, a wonderful thing. I have to share this with you. I've always remembered it. I remember in our youth group years ago, uh, there was a young man, Randall Kingsley, who worked with Campus Crusade for Christ. And he always tried to express this truth to us in this way. He said, if you've ever gone out, and you've seen me do this, some of you, um, have you ever gone out and seen an apple tree produce apples? Do you see the apple tree out in the yard just shaking, you know, to try to produce fruit? <laughs> no, it happens naturally because the water comes up through the roots and photosynthesis, all the things that come together to produce the apples. Okay, so what we do, the more we abide in Christ, the more fruit that we will have in our lives, the soil is richer as it comes, as we gather all the nutrients that we need to produce fruit through the vine. So question, how do we abide in the vine as this chapter tells us to do? Yes. Whenever I see that word, <clears throat> the phrase to be at home comes to my mind. To, just to be at home in the vine, mm -hmm. not only for the protection of the vine and the comfort, but the responsibilities, but just to be at home in the Lord. Okay, to be at home. What does that mean to you, to be at home in the Lord? Exactly, to, to feel comfortable mm -hmm. with this focus. Okay, to be at home. You're very familiar. Familiar, that's a very good thing. Okay, you're familiar. To dwell with. To dwell with. That's great. Okay. To be totally relaxed. Okay. Be at home. Relaxed. Welcome. Welcome. All of those things. Very good. Okay. Yes, Sally? I'm not suggesting that. This is part of my problem. When I think of fruit, I think of souls one. Okay. I mean, I have a very narrow okay. focus, and I have to go back okay. to Galatians 
522. The okay. fruit of the, of the Spirit is love, is joy, is peace, yes. is long-suffering, is gentleness, is goodness, mm -hmm. is faith, is meekness, temperance. Okay. It doesn't say conversions. Right. The word conversion <laughs> don't appear, doesn't appear there. Souls one. In fact, most of those things, where do most of those things take place? In heart. In your heart. So what he's trying to do is work in us to be the right channels, the right people. Okay. So soul winning. So what are some of these fruits that appear? Love, joy, peace. Love Those suffering. things, and, and then we're thinking from the heart. Remember, the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of the heart proceed the issues of life. So if you're not producing those types of things, um, you know, what if your heart was um, putting out hatred? Bitter. Bitterness. Yeah. And the Bible tells us in the book of James, I believe that you can't have both coming out, mm -hmm. bitterness and fresh water. They just don't come out of the same place. Okay, so tell you what, let's go back to this, to be at home. So what's it mean to abide in Christ? What all does it include? Certainly to feel at home. What do you do to abide in Christ? Um, Stay in the word. That's right. You've got the word. Okay, and how what can that look like? You're reading it, you're hearing it. Um, where would you hear it? You're studying it. Everyone in this room is studying the word. Yes, studying. So um, and we know study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> okay. So okay. teaching your word can help you. Teaching, yes. Okay, teaching. I've learned more from teaching than than otherwise. Okay, the word you're hearing it, you're listening to it, music, um, meditating on it, embracing it, the things that we uh, learn. Julie, what about <clears throat> trials? Okay, like we're seeing right now with war and everything like that. Yes, mm -hmm. that's forces a lot of people to get close to God, even people that never have thought of getting close right. to God. Doesn't that bring forth fruit? Yes. And especially, I've often shared with ladies that I've had opportunity to encourage them more on one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. Um, I've often said to them, what happens if you're going down a river in a raft and you hit the rapids Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you just go? <laughs> That's exactly right. You don't throw your hands up in the air and go, oh, this is terrible, you know, and let go of the boat. No. You grip the raft. You do. That's right. You've done it twice. Yes. Don't go do it. That's right. I mean, it's, it's fine when you fall off the thing and then you look up there and you're wetsuit is getting torn off because yes. it's doing this we called it wash yeah oil. okay but yeah that is a scary part yes but god and the point i'm trying to make is this me a rock, well he, there was nobody there i didn't think but this guy came out and said grab that thing would you i'm tired <laughs> okay Boom. that's my point to grab that thing when you go through the rapids when you go through trials that's when you hold on the tightest. That's when you hold on to the truths, the things that anchor you in your life. That's when you keep those things the closest to your heart. And uh, that's when you need God's power uh, to work in you, especially uh, when we have trials. Yes, Debbie? Oh, well, I also think it's to abide is you have to really trust in the Lord. Yes. Even though you don't know what the outcome is going to be or how it's going to happen. Yes. But then when you trust, then you have to learn how to surrender. 
yes. to let him do it and not to try to do it on your own. Yes. You know, that's a big deal. Yeah. It really is. Because again, we want to do, sometimes people want to serve God, but serve their own way. But when you come to the word, you find some specific directions sometimes about how to deal with uh, situations. And so you have to surrender. Yes, did Kathy, did you? you well, I was just going to say obedience is a huge part of that. Too. Okay, a abiding in Christ. And... Yeah, that's exactly right. So when we talk about abiding in Christ, it is going to your prayer closet and praying. I would put that at the top. Okay, so you want to pray as you abide in Christ. Can you really abide in Christ? without coming to him in prayer? No. Not really, can you? Um, you can focus on, some people uh, focus on Bible study more than prayer. Some people focus on prayer in the little Bible study, but for the balanced Christian life, you need both. And God's telling you, you need both. Um, so let's answer these questions quickly. So what is it that God desires that we do in verse eight? looking at this he does he desires that we all what bear fruit that we and how much fruit he wants us to bear much fruit and it says how are we powerless to do as god desires and we've talked about that when we don't abide in the vine um so we we must abide in the vine but uh verse mm, what does all this do? There's a verse in here that we don't have a question for it, but it tells us that it does what when we're, we produce this fruit? Verse 8. We glorify God. That's right. As Christians, we're to glorify the Lord. And so when we're abiding in the vine and um, we glorify God by the fruit that we bear, and he desires that we glorify him. We bring glory to his name. Uh, I did sing this last night, so I'll sing it to you. <clears throat> I'm not an opera singer or any kind of person. I've sung this to my class before, but years ago, I learned this song about this. It taught me a truth I never forgot. It goes like this. Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Love, joy, patience, peace, all these fruits are mine. I found prosperity, power, and victory, abiding, abiding in the vine. Amazing. That's just part of it. Oh, wow. But I thought I'd bless you with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we want to abide in the vine. And I'll leave that up there as we go on. But any other thoughts on this before we move on? Anyone? Okay, let's go. Um, we've got on the top of page 73, turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And here Paul related that God had allowed Satan to buffet him with an infirmity of the body. 2 Corinthians 12, 5 and 9. Paul explained that God allowed it so he would be continually reminded of his own weakness and would need to depend constantly on God to carry out his ministry. You know, I really have never thought about the uh, cancer that I went through. I mean, I have thought about it. I mean, why did God allow it? I guess because of what happened to my mom who died of cancer, my sister died of cancer. I really just didn't want to find out why. I just wanted to get through it. So as I was looking at this today, I realized that um, it, it was helpful to me because I wanted to approach that question, but I thought, you know, is it failure? Why did God do this or allow this for me? I, you know, I thought this was for the other, other members of my family and not me, uh, but he did want to remind me of my own weakness. You can't, you can't get around that. Uh, when something happens, and and it is a reminder uh, that I constantly need to depend on him, and I am glad for that. That's really 
a great thing. So sometimes I, you know, one of the thoughts that disturbs me, I'm not five years out yet. Usually if you get two years past your surgery, my surgery was in April of 2019. So I'm well past the two year mark, but they really don't say you're home free, so to speak, until you pass five year mark. So every once in a while, you know, you think, well, you know, could, could this come back? I hope not. Um, but it has helped me to depend on God more. My energy levels where I don't seem to have the physical power I'd like to have at times, but I'm very thankful because just over the last month, six weeks, I feel like I've jumped up to a different level of energy. Um, for me, that's terrific, you know, because I, you know, kind of go and then drag and go and drag. <laughs> and I've found I can go. And I want to share this with you, too. I had to get alone with the Lord because I just had some things that were kind of hanging on me. And I think I was trying to work through myself, um, some relational things back with family, just some things bothering me that I just wasn't ready to let go of and um, just things. So finally, I just got alone with God and said, Lord, I can't be concerned about these things. I'll do the best I can and do what I think is right, what you'd have me to do. Uh, but I can't let this drag me down. And you know, my energy levels have just really popped up since then. And I thought, well, maybe the physical body's changing, but the spiritual body can spiritual condition of our hearts really helps us with energy and uh, ability to to do things and power that maybe we weren't expecting and so I feel grateful to God but let's go and talk about Paul here consider 2 Corinthians 12 9 and 10 does somebody want to read that And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Very good. So let's think through this. What promise did the Lord Jesus make to Paul in this? These two verses. Grace, Grace is sufficient. And That's if right. is sufficient, it covers all the bases. <laughs> yes. Okay, so my grace is sufficient. So here's your problem, but I can give you the grace to get through this issue. Um, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Um, and again, what's grace? When God gives to us something we don't deserve, it's unmerited favor. And so he's, he helps us. Um, what's that next one? Do you think the same promise applies to us in our weaknesses, whatever they might be, in ours, same as Paul? Yes. What makes you say that? Someone said, you said yes? Yeah. Okay. Well. Got to explain yourself. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. He's, especially as I've gotten older and all these aches and pains, and he, he still gives me the strength to go and do something once in a while. <laughs> okay. That's right. He gives you the grace. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen someone who does something who's just plain hurting? Yeah. I've seen people who do things. I'll go, oh, that's okay. And I'm thinking, I really hope they don't hurt each other, hurt themselves more, you know, or something. But sometimes God just gives great, great grace to different I know individuals. before I had my knee surgery, my knee was yeah. hurting so bad. And I was in the choir, and, and uh, after I had my knee surgery and stuff, and one of the ladies says, the pain in your face is gone. Oh, because <laughs> I could say, and Pastor Josh was always worried about me because Pastor Jason said I could use a stool if I had to. 
because I couldn't stand it anymore. Sure. Now, yeah. Wow. Well, that's really God's grace there, yes. yeah, for sure. Um, any thoughts on that, Julie? Fear of the unknown, it really weakens you. Yes. You really have to feel that um, God will provide you yes. the strength you need, especially when it comes to fear for your family gotcha. and their salvation. Right. <coughs> right. And some things are just out of our control. And so what do you do when things are just out of your control? You just take it to the Lord mm -hmm. and say, Lord, and he will watch over. He will take care better than we could take care. Katie Richards played I Must Tell Jesus uh -huh. to begin the service last Sunday. And that that's when I must tell Jesus. I can't handle this. I must tell Jesus. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I like that, Sally. That's exactly right. Okay, and, and C, what was Paul's attitude then toward all of his infirmities, weaknesses, and anything that seemed to bring him to the end of himself? Bring it on. <laughs> okay, that's right. That's right. He gloried in his infirmities, and that's something hard for us, I think, to grasp. Um especially the second part of verse nine, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's hard to do. <laughs> That's right. And then let's look at D. In verse 10, Paul declared that he actually took pleasure in any circumstances that exposed his inabilities and lack of power. Wow. Could we truthfully say that too? Why did Paul make such a declaration? What do you mean by that, putting that declaration? What that's word is not oh, the declaration. Why did he make such a statement as this? Um, that if he was, he takes pleasure in his infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions distresses for Christ's sake. Um, well, he's glorifying <clears throat> Christ that way. He glorifies, yeah, the Lord. How many things do we know about Paul that he could have just shriveled up? What about when the Romans hauled him off and put him in jail? Or when the Philippian jailer put him in jail? You know, or those people who let, you know, who stoned him? You know, I remember going, I, I broke the law. I was going down a I it was like a 25 no it was a 40 mile per hour zone and I was going like 50 and I was in a hurry and so I got pulled over this was back some years ago but I ended up I was going to get these points on my license and ticketed you know fine and I thought this is just ridiculous because I wasn't going that fast but I broke the law so I decided I would go to court and so so I get to court and, you know, and the room was full of people and there's the judge way up there and a big table in front of us. And I remember coming up and, and I thought I had it, you know, I wanted to say some things, but when the judge started to speak, it was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, I forget whatever I said, but you know, that boldness all of a sudden left me. I wasn't too bold, um, but you know, sometimes we can kind of fail. You know, our timidity, we can be overcome. What I was did a bit you want overcome. to say? Pardon me? What did you intend to say? I had never gotten a ticket. I'd been driving for 30 years and never had a ticket. And I wanted to say, you know, <laughs> that I was going to argue my case. And I thought, no, this is dumb. <laughs> 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 You know, so so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to defend my my record. You know, I thought maybe you could at least give me a blue ribbon for the 30 years I had made any, any mistakes. You know, although there are some insurance. That, that's why I was curious. She just hadn't been caught. Ribbons were not being caught. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, when they have that little hammer. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. But I can remember I was 
Well, it was Valentine's Day, and I was headed up to speak. Okay. And all of a sudden, here's the thing going in the back. Yeah. And he pulled me over. And he was, where do you think you're going that fast? I said, I don't think I'm going that fast. And then he asks for all the stuff that you've got. And he said, I'm going to tell you one thing. You either forget your trip to Arapaho Basin, uh -oh. or you slow your butt down in that red car. Oops! <laughs> and I thought, oh, arrest for me, shame Ray. on him. What? A, I mean, I know what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I never forgot that because I thought, you know, he was right. I gotcha. Get <laughs> I know we get ourselves in trouble, but tell you what. And I did, I will say this, they did cut everything in half. The fine was cut in half and my points were cut in half. So that was good. Okay, well, tell you what, let's go on and we've got to finish, wrap this up. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, look at these last, these three verses down here, which are wonderful verses. So I, I lacked power that day. <laughs> okay, but... Um, yeah, the whole <coughs> arrangement can be intimidating, but as believers, we're never at a loss for the power we need to do God's will. Christ promised this. What assurances concerning this power do you find in these passages? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10 um, tells us, but we have this treasure in earthly vessel, vessels within our bodies, a treasure that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's, it's a treasure that we possess in our hearts, in our very beings, the Holy Spirit of God. Um, we can't forget that. Second Timothy 1, 7 through 9, for God hath not given us the spirit of what? Fear. Fear. But of what? Oh, power, and love, sound and sound mind. I think I had a sound mind that day <laughs> and love, but I did lack the power. <clears throat> okay, and then 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4, his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Um, we talked a lot about that in this conference this past weekend. Everything that we need to do our lives, God has given us his word and he's given us his power that's available to us. And one other point, we're, we're about running out of time here, but one other point I'd like to make on page 74, it says the key verse of this lesson is Matthew 28, 18, which is that one that says all power, Jesus said, is given unto me in heaven and earth. And it's just before the great commission. And I want us to grasp this truth. B, why did he make this claim at that particular time? How do those two verses, three verses relate? The Great Commission telling us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How does that relate to all power is given unto me? They would need, his disciples and apostles would need God's power to do that. That's right. We need his power, but also what else is it stating? Well, he was leaving, but he wasn't going to leave us alone. Right. right. He and, was going to leave us with the Holy Spirit. Right. That's true. But I believe he's saying all power has been given unto me in heaven and, and uh, earth. And, uh, and then he gives you a command. So he's in charge. He has all authority. Um, he can give us this command because he is the one in charge. And so as we go forward and he tells us what to do, one of the things about Christ, if you read through the Gospels, you'll see is that he, he always worked at trying to help people understand who he was. For instance, what did he say to Peter when they were at um, at the base of Mount Hermon? He said, what? Um, who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. You are the Christ, yeah. the son of the living God. And it took Peter time to get there. 
and the other disciples. And it was only after they discovered and understood who he really was that he began to teach them about his mission, that he would have to die. Um, so that's an amazing thing. But here he's giving us the command to go and to teach all, all nations, teaching them to observe all things. So this is what he's given to us to do. And he has the authority and the power to tell us to do this. He's the creator, the one who's over all. Um, so let's real quick end with, um, if you skip to 75, question 13. Christ, excuse me, if we as believers claim to believe that the Father and Christ are omnipotent, all-powerful, why do you think we struggle to trust God to take care of the needs, situations, and people in our lives? We're constantly battling our flesh. Okay, we, yeah, that's a big one. Battling the flesh. I didn't have that. I'm going to put it down. Battling our flesh. What else? Lack of faith and trust. Absolutely. Lack of faith and trust. And again, this right here is what will help us with both of those things. Um, anyone else? Temptation. Temptation, we fail. We just plain outright fail. We do things that are wrong sometimes. Our pride tries to tell us we can do it ourselves first. That's right. And we don't depend on him. Our pride, that's right. In fact, um, we were just reading in Second Chronicles about Asa the king. Um, he had gone up. He needed to fight Bisha, the uh, king of Israel, the kingdom was divided but instead of going to the lord he went to the king of syria ben hadad and asked ben hadad to help him win the battle god had already given him great victory and so what happened the prophet comes to asa and and says because of this you're always going to have wars and um he did he suffered he was judged because he did not go to God first with his problem. So yeah, that lack of faith and trust in fixing things, doing things our own way instead of God's way uh, can be very bad. So tell you what, we want this power and uh, let's just go to the end because we don't have time to go over everything. <clears throat> A question you can think about on the top of 76B, how can we be sure we're doing Christ's work in his power? I think, again, knowing that we're in close communion with him will help with that. But let's just look at the closing uh, verse here. Two verses she gave us, I think are wonderful. Psalm 68, 35. The God of Israel is he that gives strength and power unto his people uh, to do his will, of course, and is able at the end, Ephesians 3.20, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He's done exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think for me. Um, tell you what, Ellen, do you want to close this in prayer today? Okay.